So we can stop watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch or they can make you great people. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of TRD Talks Live. I'm Eric Enquist, Senior Managing Editor at The Real Deal, and I am thrilled to be joined by two high-profile guests today. But before I, int I introduce them, just a reminder, please go to therealdeal.com and subscribe so we can continue bringing these to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 5 o'clock. So our two guests today are Dan Doctoroff and Alicia Glenn. I'll give you a quick rundown of their resumes because if I went through the whole thing, it would take the whole show. Dan Doctoroff helped lead the city's recovery from 9-11. He led an effort to bring the Olympics to New York City. He was the chief executive officer of Bloomberg LP, and he founded Sidewalk Labs with Google, and he now runs Sidewalk Labs. Alicia Glenn spent 12 years at Goldman Sachs, where she ran its urban investment group. She was the architect of the city's housing policy and was deputy mayor uh, of economic development and housing for five years in the de Blasio administration. Um, and she is now back in the private sector working on her next venture. So welcome to two of the most prominent uh, deputy mayors for economic development, I think, in the city's history. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having us. Dan, I want to start with you. You wrote an op-ed uh, recently in the New York Times about reopening, and you outlined some ideas on steps that we can take both in the short term and long term uh, to recover from the pandemic. I, I want you to give us your, your take on how you feel. It's been a few weeks since that was published, and how you feel we have done so far in terms of the steps we've taken and what we need to do next. Well. First of all, let me say, it seems like it's been 10 years since I wrote that a few weeks ago, just given everything that has happened. And, you know, I, I do think it's important at the top just to acknowledge the protest and the need for real reform to address structural racism and lack of racial equality. I know it's not today's topic, but all these topics are connected and too many people in New York and other cities around the world simply do not have access to opportunity, whether that's because of unequal treatments by police or others, uh, or access to lack of access to housing they can't afford. And so, you know, we just have to understand that that is just so much a part of what we have to do. But, you know, in terms of recovering from this, it's going to be a rocky road. Um, and um, the, the whole notion of the city um, is being challenged. The notion of density, which is what makes New York so exciting, provides it with the energy, is fundamentally being challenged. So the first thing we have to do is reestablish confidence in the city itself. And I think we have to do that by becoming a real leader in public health. We've had that reputation historically, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to have to go way beyond what we've done before. Density, in fact, is not a curse when it comes to public health. We've seen many other cities around the world who have more dense than New York who have done generally fine throughout this. But if we don't have sort of a new standard of hygiene and preparedness and probably connectedness, um, the recovery is going to be much more difficult. That said, I'll just say one other thing, and then, you know, you can ask the question of Alicia, but is that the model of growth that we've operated under for this city for a long time that is so necessary to generating the revenue to pay for these services and provide opportunity was clearly running out of steam before. And so I think what we probably will want to talk about is how do we create a new model of truly inclusive growth that hopefully can set a global standard? That, I believe, is going to be the key to our recovery. No, that's, that's interesting. And I want to get back to the running out of steam thing because there are different takes on that. But Alicia, what are, what are your thoughts? You know, until a year ago, you were in the room making decisions. You would have been making decisions that you stayed uh, on how the city reopens and what it does. And what are your thoughts on how we've done so yeah. far? Well, I mean, first off, I want to echo what Dan said with respect to, you know, the, the challenges that the city is facing right now are 
you know, really just exacerbating what have been the issues for, you know, black and brown people for, for you know, a hundred years and sort of the entrenched disparities um, that underlie um, not just what goes on in New York City, but around the United States is something that I think COVID has, has laid bare. But these issues are not just COVID related. And I think that we should be very clear about that. Um, and, and if there's any silver lining, the fact that this has become more of a topic now um, and that there can be a more... Um, uh, an intense reaction um, and a, a thoughtfulness around how recovery can also begin to start chipping away and really a commitment to anti-racism in a way that we haven't seen, you know, for decades. That may be one of the few silver linings that comes out of all this. Um, I think with respect to how we're doing, I mean, look, at it is, it's a very complicated situation. There is no silver bullet. The notion that there is one right way to do this, I think, is also something we have to um, really question because each city and each region and does have its own issues. What I, what I do think is important is that people really understand there's short-term, medium-term, and long-term issues. And, and in the short term, it is going to be a very rocky road, and we have to be driven by the public health data and by the advice from people who are actually in the public health field and understand what we need to do in order to keep our population safe. But at the same time, we can't roll back many of the um, investments and strategies and the very reasons why people want to be in New York, we have to hold true to that um, approach. And, and so, for example, now is not the time to say, even though there may be some people who may not want to live in New York City in the next couple of years, to say that we no longer need to build housing. Right? We have to continue to be a pro-growth city and not let what was already beginning to become, I think, very much in the ether, a sort of anti-development, growing nimbyism, mm -hmm. take foot, right? really get more entrenched in light of this. Because the best way to recover is to continue to invest in the things that make New York City great to begin with, and that requires long-term investment and strategic investments that are inclusive, which was exactly where we were going before this all happened. Well, this, this may kind of be an opportunity to do that because, you know, as Dan mentioned, the, you know, the model was going awry in that we had tremendous job growth for years. You know, New York made a huge comeback and it looked like the economy tax revenue was just soaring. It looked like everything was going great. But, you know, of course, the context for that was it was going great for some people and not for others. And eventually, you know, we all grew up in the era where we were just trying to get jobs, jobs, jobs all the time. And suddenly jobs became a bad thing. Jobs became, you know, something that was going to drive us out of our neighborhood. Um, jobs became something that someone else was going to get, you know, outsiders were going to come in and get the jobs. So, um, Alicia, you, you sort of encountered a very different environment than, you know, the one that, that Dan did when Dan was trying to add jobs and you were trying to assure people that jobs were okay. I mean, how did you manage that transition? Well, I mean, I think these things are all connected. I mean, I think Dan and Dan came into office when, again, the notion that New York City was coming back at all was a legitimate question because what had happened to New York happened to New York. What is happening with COVID is happening globally. And so, you know, the, the challenge of, of our recovery is a little bit different. It's very deep, but we are not at a disadvantage by having been the locus of a particular attack and a particular disadvantage that we had to build our way out of. And so I commend Dan for all the work they did to, to prove that New York was still a place where you want to do business and grow. I would take some umbrage with, I don't think that we're in a situation where people no longer think we need jobs. I think the challenge is getting the narrative correct around how broad-based economic growth is, is necessary to create a wide array of jobs along a continuum of skills for a continuum of people with different levels of education, but that each of those jobs and all of those companies that we want to continue to have in New York City, people have the opportunity to, in fact, ladder up and that you are not stuck in a very low wage job and that everybody else is climbing the ladder. And so I think the challenge is not that people, when they think about it, are anti-jobs. It's people want to understand how jobs can, in fact, bring them opportunity over the long run and be able to grow a family or a business in the greatest city in the world. And I think we have lost that narrative along the way because the barbell has gotten so extreme. 
But 99% of people in the street are not anti-jobs. And I think mm-hmm. that that's really important to continue. Right. To- even, even when Amazon was coming in, you know, the polls show Amazon was favored by more than half of New Yorkers. It was just like the minority was very loud and eventually you were able to drive but, the, the company out. But I do think you can look back on Amazon as sort of a watershed moment. I mean, Alicia did a spectacular job of helping to bring Amazon. And I do believe it would have been a a great thing for New York, and we will suffer for it for a long time. Um, but it really was a reflection of the fact that, um, that well, people do understand that growth is important. As I like to say, you know, you got to be prosperous to be progressive at the end of the day. What they really were starting to recoil at is the notion that they didn't have confidence that the benefits of that growth were going to be distributed fairly. That's what we mean when we say inclusive growth. And we're going to have to develop a new model because if we aren't, then things like Amazon will continue to happen. The rezonings that have been defeated um, will continue to happen. They may be defeated by relatively small minorities or local council members who have too much say over sort of what may be citywide imperatives. But we've got to be able to convince people that the benefits of that growth are going to accrue to everybody in this community. And that actually, we, as Alicia said, we kind of lost that narrative and we're gonna have to rebuild it. But it's not just about a narrative. I mean, the reality is the population of this city has started to fall. It had started to fall before um, COVID-19. Uh, And that is the most dangerous sign. It's basically saying people are voting with their feet because they don't believe this city is working for them. We have got to change the substance underlying that. All right. I think it it fell by maybe 100,000 for two or three consecutive years, which wasn't people didn't really notice it. But it was at first we thought it was an anomaly, but it turned out not to be. We were definitely flatlining. And I think the cost of housing had a lot to do with that. And I do want to talk about the cost of housing. But first, you know, in terms of this maybe being an opportunity to reset the narrative now that we are in probably facing a couple of years of recovery, do you think it'll be easier to make that argument that we need to add jobs and add growth um, that, I mean, I thought that would be easier to make. And uh, let me just pose the question this way, you know, the Gowanus rezoning, which is in process now, you know, I notice now there's some people saying, oh, we, we can't build because we don't want to add density because density is now dangerous. And uh, Dan, you mentioned there are cities around the world that are as dense or more dense than New York, where there have not been outbreaks of uh, the, massive outbreaks of COVID. Eric, the issue is not density. As we, uh, that is not the issue. The issue is overcrowding. And overcrowding is a function of a lack of having enough housing. And so the notion that people at Gowanus are now, would, would in any way, shape, or form not be in favor of trying to create a blueprint for what now everybody calls inclusive economic development is, is, really, is, is really misguided because the whole purpose of thinking through a neighborhood like Gowanus to assure that as it grows, there really is a mix of housing, a mix of light industrial, a appropriate mix of retail and jobs and the kinds of neighborhood improvements. And yes, to increase density so that we can have more housing, so that we can have less overcrowding, we can begin to continue the work that we started over the past 10 years to make a real dent in the housing crisis. These things don't happen overnight. These are, these are long-term plans that require consistent political leadership and being responsive to what's happening on the ground. But for people to abandon the notion of rezonings that permit more residential density would be one of the biggest mistakes we could do in this recovery. It is not an excuse to go backwards. It's not an excuse to cut the capital budget for long-term investments. And in fact, we should be screaming it from the hilltops to continue to make these investments that pay off in multiple ways over multiple decades. Yeah. The only way we're going to actually recover, and by the way, the only way we're going to provide opportunity and make this a fair city is to become more dense. Um, we need to do it thoughtfully, carefully. We need to do it in a way that, that um, distributes the benefits more fairly. But if we can't do that, then the model of New York 
fundamentally deteriorates. And by the way, we can't take that for granted. People forget that the city hasn't always grown. You know, in the 1960s, the city was was doing well. By the 1970s, the quality of life had deteriorated. The city was in fiscal crisis. 800,000 people left this city. And this vicious cycle of decline kind of perpetuated itself as people left the city, the budgets got retrenched, quality of life deteriorated, and more people left. We can't let that happen. And the way to do that is to continue to invest. But in order to do that, we have to convince people that density um, is a good thing. And it's, you know, going to really- one of, the, one of the things is, one of the things about density is, um, unfortunately, the messaging has not been great from the governor or the mayor on this because they keep saying COVID spread wildly here because we were so dense. You know, that wasn't the reason. We had two, actually not enough housing units, so too many people in each one, right? So if you have, a, a, you know, seven or eight people crowd into a housing unit, of course it's going to spread. The, the highest priority we have is to dramatically increase the supply of housing. Um, and do it in a thoughtful way that, by the way, is also sustainable, which means typically around transit access, which is also critical. Um, and we're going in order to do that, we're going to have to be incredibly creative, particularly in a budget constrained environment. But both the de Blasio administration and the Bloomberg administration found lots of new ways to do that. Key to it all, though, is expanding the supply, which we have to do through rezonings. Yeah, and I think it also is why, you know, the, these issues around what we should be choosing to invest in in a budget-constrained environment are really critical for people to understand that. And, and Dan's right, one of the most amazing things about New York City is that they use their capital budget to leverage unbelievable amounts of private investment and other resources from the state and federal government. And again, we'll go back to housing it leverages seven or eight dollars per capital dollar, as opposed to all the money gets put into building a jail, right? You're not leveraging money by building a jail. And so the notion of having, you know, the key to the strategy of recovery is to continue to double down on the things that leverage money, address the structural inequities of the city, which are driven largely by having not enough affordable housing in neighborhoods all around the city. And so we have to be very smart about what budget choices we're making because they reflect our political values in a very concrete way at this moment. Well, I'm going to I'm going to pin you down on that because the mayor just got hundreds of millions of dollars from the housing capital budget. And, and I disagree with that strongly. I think it's it's one of the most short sighted things I've ever seen. I think it is it is really penny wise and pound foolish. Um, the debt service on that capital budget for the housing um, bonds are are, are are de minimis. You know, there are so many ways in which we could take a harder look at the operating budget and a hundred billion dollar budget right now. And I think that many people would agree that if agencies were asked to take a real hard look and find 5% savings on a $100 billion budget, they could find it, and certain agencies not excluded. And that in and of itself would give you enough to continue your capital program. So, I mean, this is a time of really making hard choices, but having a really honest conversation about what we want to be as a city. And stopping spending on housing or schools or not moving forward with things like sunny side yards would be incredibly irresponsible with respect to a long-term plan about recovery. Yeah, let, me, let me Go just ahead, say if, if you don't grow, you shrink. If you shrink, you, you die and we can't afford to put ourselves in that position. That does not mean that we don't have to convince people and in substance actually achieve greater equity in the way in which we build, in the way in which we allocate housing, et cetera. But that is absolutely critical to our future. One of the tricky things is that the folks who oppose growth are the ones who are already housed. 
and they're the ones who are voting. So when you have a rezoning hearing, you know, those are the folks who come out and scream and yell, and the council members seem to respond to that. Alicia, you laid out a very, what seemed to me a sensible, logical, um, even brilliant, you know, mandatory inclusionary housing policy where you'd rezone and some of the the for-profit housing would subsidize affordable housing. And that seemed to be going pretty well right up until the point where, you know, meetings were held and suddenly you know, had several rezonings that died before they even got out of the crib. And then one that was uh, maybe being killed in court now. So how do you persuade those council members to stop this? I'm talking about Carl, I'm talking about Sal Salamanca, Raphael Salamanca, <laughs> and you know, the Northern Brooklyn one also died. I mean, I don't want to use this time to talk about particular scenarios with different council people and, and sort of how the political sausage is made. But I think it's fair to say that generally speaking, MIH was and continues to be one of the most successful initiatives of the de Blasio administration because it really reset the entire um, discussion around what growth means. Right Before, we had relied purely on an incentive basis, allowing people to earn into inclusionary. And now the, the contract with community really changes when people know that a building or a neighborhood that is being rezoned, there will be affordable housing. That's, that is a hard narrative to explain to people, and you don't necessarily see it the next day because you're building new buildings. But I also don't think it's fair to say that because some of the rezonings have gone a little bit sideways or there are complex politics around it, that the fundamental thesis around using zoning to promote truly inclusive growth is wrong or dying. I think it's a question of leadership. I think you also have um, a city council that are always either running for re-election or term limited out. So you're not in a situation where long-term thinking and profiles and courage are necessarily front and center. I've obviously been very open about this. <laughs> and I think that we have to take a hard look, and Dan is right, of those types of decisions around growth cannot be simply made because of one particular councilman and whether or not you're going to give them a pocket park or whatever deal you're going to make, which Dan and I spent many, many years making deals. There's not, that's not bad, but we're talking about the future of our city, which in some respects is the future of our region. And we do need to really rethink how we govern as it relates to growth. And I think that that's a legitimate question for the next couple of years. Yeah. And it's the future of the country, right? Because we are a model for the rest of the we're also going to have to find new ways of generating revenue um, in order to pay for it. And, you know, one of the things we both did is find new ways to, to generate revenue to pay for housing. We leveraged this sort of a city owned bank housing development corporation to be able to do that. You know, mandatory inclusion is a way of inclusionary zoning is actually a way of achieving that. Maybe there are others. Maybe every single time we rezone, we ought to capture um, some of the increase in that value and put it into an entity like HDC or some other entity that can then be leveraged to produce more housing. There's lots of different creative ways to do things. The key thing is we got to generate the revenue, the capital to be able to pay for it. And we have to do that in a constrained time, but we have to make it a priority. And that really requires leadership. It's very tricky when you have local rezonings to say, because you have to direct the benefits to the, lo to the local community. Otherwise, they don't believe it's going to get to them. So if you throw it in a citywide fund, that doesn't get you any votes locally. And, you know, well, so but, you know, sometimes you just have to sit there go ahead. I mean, that's true, but one of the reasons why we did what we did, which is called the Neighborhood Development Fund, was to actually have specific capital dollars allocated to the neighborhoods where we were doing rezonings to precisely at least begin to address some of those problems. But I think Dan's right that the bigger issue is how are we going to be able to sustain all of these capital investments that we need to make. And it's not just in housing, right? We have to continue to invest in the arts because one of the reasons why everybody wants to live in New York and talent is in New York is because we have an incredibly robust arts and culture community. And so these things are all interconnected. And so I think that the challenge right now in the short term is to try to do as little harm as possible to our fiscal situation and make sure that we're not making mistakes that will in fact mortgage the future and make it 
very, very difficult for us to continue to make these longer term strategic investments. Because again, it, it is housing, obviously my first love and focus, but you know, imagine a city where our arts and cultural institutions are no longer getting city support, where we don't have the parks and open spaces and the diversity of uses that make New York City the fabulous city it is. Because then you come back to the problem, which we started with, which is why would a company want to be in New York? What is New York without all of those things? And so, you know, I think we have to take a much harder look at our short-term budget, make smart decisions, but keep our capital program growing and use this as a chance to understand how we spend money and why we do it. It shouldn't cost $4 million to build a toilet in the parks department, right? I mean, we have, I mean, Dan, how many times have we talked about this? But now, right, you know what? The governor and the mayor could be helping us reform our procurement rules so that capital projects don't cost as much as they do. I mean, there are lots of smart and innovative ways that we can really take a look under the hood and make sure we're making choices that aren't undermining our future. In terms of the economic engine, you know, it really is the central business districts, right? It's lower Manhattan, it's Midtown, it's maybe Hudson Yards. Um, so that model, I mean, how, how that seemed to be going great right up until COVID hit, right? Central business districts, you know, take a lot of smart people, put them in, an, you know, one spot, have them bounce ideas off each other, you know, have random interaction, networking, innovation. Uh, and suddenly now everyone's into work from home. So, you know, Dan, I wonder if you could give us your take on, you know, what we're going to see over the next couple of years. I'm actually more positive about the future of office space, for example. And by the way, I should point out that, you know, it wasn't just in sort of lower Manhattan or downtown Brooklyn or the midtown, including Hudson Yards, where we saw meaningful uh, growth in employment. The biggest growth actually occurred in Brooklyn and all over Brooklyn and in Queens and even the Bronx had dramatically higher growth than, say, Manhattan over the last 15 years or so. So we could need to think of this as a five-borough strategy across the entire city. And that's also really important because one of the huge inequalities is the distance people have to travel to get to work. So the more we can spread out opportunity, the easier it is for people to actually get to work, which is a huge benefit for families and, and New Yorkers in general. That said, you know, I, I'm really more optimistic about uh, about kind of the future of office space. I, I really do believe that the best ideas are created when people are present. And I think there's all sorts of research, by the way, to support that. You know, the CEO of Google said the other day that working from home is great for three months or whatever, six months, until somebody has to develop the next big idea. Mm -hmm. And companies thrive on ideas. And the way people generate ideas is serendipity. It's being together. And so, yes, I believe that companies will offer more flexibility. You won't have to come into the office every single day. But I do think the core of the week, you know, will be for the vast majority of companies, people present in the same place. So a little bit of this impact of the reduction in the number of people in offices will certainly occur. That's also going to get offset, I believe, by reversing the trend toward less office space per person, right. largely as a result of sort of the fear of, of you know, health impacts. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, assuming, by the way, we don't blow it over the next several years and not make these investments, watch people lead because the quality of life in this city declines or work. Don't give people confidence in the future. And then we're in bad shape. That's the, the risk is over those next several years when we've got to inspire confidence in the future of this city. And we've got to retain people to the extent we possibly can. Just one more anecdote, or, and I'll, I'll stop. But I heard today from somebody who had talked to a person on the board of a private school in Palm Beach who told my friend that they had received 72 applications from New Yorkers uh -huh. for entry into that school for the fall. We can't lose those people. We're seeing that in the Hamptons as well, by the way. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, guys. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's fabulous that everybody's in the Hamptons and Palm Beach. And, and I understand that's a small problem. And we, and we have to make sure that we don't lose our highest earners. But I think we need to go back to, to, to the point, which is correct, that, you know, we did and we have been on a very strong path towards having a more deliberate five borough economy, right? Really thinking about strategies where living and working and playing, going to school, do you know, it's both a sort of spreading out strategy, but is also a very deliberate, inclusive strategy. And that's why we made extraordinary investments in places like the Navy Yard, in BAT, in the, in the rezoning of Long Island City, so that you can also have multiple places where there are opportunities for people to live and work. And I think one of the things that is true also is that you know, if anybody, New Yorkers are incredibly resilient and innovative and kooky and crazy. And so I think that the other thing we don't know yet is the kind of innovation that can come out of a crisis with respect to whether it's architecture and typology of new buildings. I mean, yes, there will be ultimately a vaccine. And I do believe people will more and more want to come back to work because Dan's right. It's not just, you know, the, the magic happens when there's EQ and IQ. And it's very hard to have that kind of relationship virtually. And and I think it'll be a really interesting time if we don't screw it up. And you have places like Long Island City and the Bronx and Brooklyn where you can have different kinds of building typologies. You can get mm-hmm. to work by ferry. You can bike. You can take a gondola. If, we, if Dan and I ever get our, our, our dreams of having aerial trams. I think that it's a real opportunity to revisit all of the things that we've been doing and prosecuting forward and why places like Sunnyside Yards offer an opportunity to be that model of a post-COVID, truly mixed-income, mixed-use community that takes advantage of many of the learning. So you're a fan and of Sunnyside. You're a fan of Sunnyside Yards. I, I take it. Uh, I don't know, Dan. Have you followed that project? I was okay, dubious uh, because how do you build affordable houses over rail yards? One of the places that we originally proposed putting the Olympic Village way back in sort of the mid 1990s. It's it's one of the great sites um, in New York. Um, we have to solve the problem of how to pay for the platform, but Felicia knows a lot more about that now than I do. Um, but it's look, it's it's hundreds and hundreds of acres with spectacular transit access that should be the home for thousands and thousands and thousands of people and businesses. Um, I always thought we should move the Javits Center in there, but other people disagreed with that. But the, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a huge opportunity, but we're going to have to be creative to do it. I do want to pick up on one point that Alicia made, which is I really believe in order to, inc- to really achieve that inclusive growth, the city is going to have to be innovative. And it's going to have to be innovative, taking advantage of technology. It's going to have to innovate in terms of the way government accommodates new kinds of regulation. Um, The thing that Sidewalk Labs does is try to innovate in sort of the urban environment. You talk about building new buildings. We're working on the creation of a company that would basically build mass timber buildings through fatter factory automation, which we think could lower the cost of building even 35 story buildings by about 20% and reduce the time to build them by 35%. Imagine the contribution that that could actually make to increasing affordability. And there's a lot of technology and new approaches today that if government could just get out of its own way and work with innovators, we could do amazing things. I mean, I think Dan's absolutely right. I mean, you know, when I was at the city, we were the first time we were able to actually launch um, a pilot program to do modular housing for affordable and senior housing. And, and that's one technology that has its uses in a dense urban environment and in many ways has challenges. I think Dan's point is correct, is that all of these things should be on the table but be in the table in a real way where the answer is not, how do we kill it? How do we not make it possible? Why do we hate timber? Why do we hate modular? You know, who are we pissing off by changing the status quo? 
you can't change the status quo without attacking the status quo. And I, and I think, again, this is what is where we find ourselves in this moment in history where if we're serious about addressing these very complicated issues around race and economic inequality, all of this has to be on the table and we need leadership for people to say, you know what? So we'll go change that one section of that statute in some obscure law in Albany, which prevents you from using timber or using modular. Not in an irresponsible way, but in a way of saying, if we're gonna be leaders of the city for the 21st century, we have got to get out of our own way and be willing to make some pro-innovation, pro You know, there's always some interest group that's opposed to, uh, I remember th there was a debate there over, you know, <laughs> copper pipes versus PVC and, you know, the union that used all of this labor to carry the heavier pipes, they like the heavier pipes because that's where copper. leadership really comes yeah. in, right? It's you an need anti -union. Leadership it's being a leader. Yeah. To overcome those kind of very, very kind of narrow um, interest groups. And we have the capacity in New York City with a strong mayor form of government. And I do believe we're going to have a greater capacity in the face of this pandemic and its consequences to think differently about the city. In fact, I would argue that key to our future is actually being a leader in urban innovation. Uh, but we have to need, we need real leadership in order to do it. You know, the, the timber thing is exciting. Uh, you talked about 35 story buildings. I think the tallest timber building is 11 stories right now. So if that could happen, that would be great. Um, now, Alicia, you are an advisor to an, to an organization that focuses on the cost of housing. I mean, what are some ideas? Like when I look at housing costs, I think, boy, imagine if what had happened to say TVs where a $5,000 TV, you know, five years ago is now $500. Why doesn't that happen to housing? It only gets more expensive. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a lot, there's, it's a multifaceted problem as to why housing is so expensive, but I do think that utilizing new technologies um, in the construction of housing um, is, is a key area of focus, but it has to be combined again with a, with a pro-density land use policy. Um, all of these things are, are in combination. I think it's also really important to say, again, there's no one silver bullet. The kinds of Proposals, and I, again, I'm not an expert on the, on timber. It's exciting, but it wouldn't necessarily. It, it could solve one piece of the puzzle using different kinds of panelized systems, more off-site construction where people can assemble on site. That doesn't have to be what people think of as modular. There are other ways to do off-site construction that reduces the time to construct, which obviously saves money in terms of the financing of the project. I think the other thing that people don't think a lot about in New York is that although we're also, you know, we're, we're a multifamily. Um, heavy multi-story building typology. There are also many, many neighborhoods in New York that are actually pretty low density and have low number of dwelling units per acre. And I most think, of them, most of them are yeah, low density. And people don't think about that, right? That's not what comes to mind when you're like, you know, a Hauser or a Wall Street person or an investor. And I think one of the things that I've been really interested in is trying to figure out how to increase density um, in lower rise neighborhoods and lots of interesting work going on in the ADU space, which I think is much more interesting than the, than the, than the basement. Granny flats they, you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, the basement stuff I, I've always had issues with. I don't think that's where we should be spending our time and our money, but not just granny flats, but really, you know, allowing again and getting out of our own regulatory insanity to, to not be able to put up a one or two room unit in the backyard where you could house, you know, a young person or a granny. And, and to have a debate that that is still even a debate is to me just totally nuts. There's so many different ways that we could be increasing our housing supply if we utilize new technologies, but also begin to take a really hard look at what are the barriers to those things happening and, and use this political moment maybe to blow it up a little bit, right? And say, now's the time. Let me give you an example that I don't even think requires regulatory change. We made an investment in a company called Ori, which has developed a whole approach to robotic furniture. So mm -hmm. literally enabling the internal walls and units to move. So if I can actually take a 500 square foot apartment and make it feel like 650 square feet, that is actually a huge savings that yields sort of greater cost savings for the renter who's getting more space for the money, 
but also enables developers to actually build. So again, there are literally dozens, maybe hundreds of approaches that we can try that involve innovation from a technology perspective, from a regulatory perspective, from a financial perspective, to dramatically increase the supply. Ultimately, when we increase the supply of housing, we lower the cost. And that is really critical here. You know, very briefly, uh, the Bloomberg administration, I don't want to rehash everything they did, but there were something like 70 contextual you know, housing rezonings that kind of froze in place, you know, what neighborhoods already had on the side streets. Uh, do you, is that a barrier at all to, to increasing density now? Um, I think to some extent that it is. And, you know, we've got to go back and look at some of those contextual rezonings and really wonder whether we can't get more density. That doesn't mean the character of the neighborhood has to change. Some just are not appropriate um, for taller buildings or other things, but that doesn't mean we can't squeeze more out of them than we probably have thus far. I would also point out we did a total of 140 um, rezonings, rezoning 40% of the city, generating, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of housing capacity, but we need to do more um, if we're going to actually be able to continue to grow and do it in a way where we can reduce the cost of housing. Do, do tax breaks play a role at all? And you know, I'm a little dubious of them because it just seems to me that if you, if you give like 421A where you say, oh, new construction, you're going to get a 25-year, 35-year property tax break. It just seems to make the land more expensive. And so therefore, you don't, it doesn't really translate into lower cost housing. Do either of you have thoughts on that? Uh, I, I have a, obviously have a lot of thoughts on that since I spent two years reforming 421A. I mean, I think the, the, the one short answer, and I'm sure even and Dan would agree with this, is we wouldn't need 421A if we didn't have such a ridiculous property tax system to begin with. I mean, part of the challenge is that we need tax exemptions and tax incentives and tax policy to compensate for the fact that we don't appropriately tax multifamily housing. But if you assume a world where it is highly unlikely that there's going to be real structural property tax reform, although I hope that's not the case, it's also a leadership issue, I absolutely disagree with you. I think that actually structured appropriately and that we spent a lot of time on this, using tax exemptions and incentives to generate affordable housing off budget in a responsible way where the tax expenditure is not too rich, but hits the tipping point where you're in fact creating additional units. And it's one of the few ways in which you can create units in high opportunity neighborhoods. And that's incredibly important to remember because everybody talks about how unfair it is that affordable housing is always already in low and moderate income neighborhoods. And why aren't there more affordable apartments in higher opportunity or wealthier neighborhoods? Well, that's a simple mathematical equation. And so if we can spend next to nothing in order to create permanent and or long-term affordable units in neighborhoods across the city, that is an incredibly important tool in our arsenal and money well spent. Do you, do you think that that really moves the needle a whole lot? I mean, I look at housing lotteries and you, know, you have 80 apartments go up, um, you know, and maybe an apartment would be for a family that qualifies, you know, $800 a month, $1,000 a month, where the person paying market rate across the hall is paying $4,000 a month or more. But 10,000 applications will come in for those 80 apartments. It just seems like a... It goes back to what we started, right? Which is, these are all tools in a toolbox. There's no one single answer to solving the housing crisis, right? All of these things have to work in concert and you need to use different tools to, to address different problems. There is no way that the city could afford to directly build low-income housing in very high-income neighborhoods. That would be fiscally irresponsible. And so, yes, of course, the fact that there's 10,000 units for every 80, 10,000 applications for every 80 units is only reinforcing the point that we're making on this call, which is to say we need to do everything in order to increase the supply both in our affordable programs, but also just in our market rate programs and making development conducive to more multifamily housing so that we can overall, it's basic economics. Right? But, can, but basic economics is definitely a challenge for our, our political establishment. I mean, I think more people than believe that 
if you develop in an area, it raises the cost of housing. I mean, we've seen that consistently, that theme, that if you build something, all the rents are going to go up. Um, and, you know, there was a particular group, you know, Churches United, that came out with a study that tried to make that claim, and they used all kinds of old data, and, but that's being used to kill rezonings right now. I mean, how do you overcome that? Well, I mean, I, again, I don't want to talk about any particular political challenge, but I mean, one of the one of the reasons why I think that data is often used incorrectly is, in many of those neighborhoods, there's a huge amount of NYCHA in public housing, and so the rents there are very, very low and remain low. And so, of course, any additional unit is going to overall, if you look at the numerator and denominator, rents will go up. But even if rents are going up by $100 or $200 and you're creating thousands of new units that are affordable to people who are making minimum wage, that's a good thing. The key and thing is not to look at whether rents go up because that's using gross data that can be misinterpreted. The key question that we have to focus on is how do we reduce the rent burden for New Yorkers? You know, right now we have um, roughly, oh, what is it, 50% of New Yorkers who pay more than 30% of their income in housing costs. So that has to come down. And so there's a lot of things that we've talked about that can play a role in that. The single most important one is changing the ratio, the relationship between supply and demand. More supply lowers cost over time. And that's what we've got to do. Having greater supply means we add a lot of units, which we need to do, and we need to do that very carefully. And we have to spend our money, limited money, in order to achieve that very thoughtfully, which means we have to make trade-offs. I've, I've always said sort of one of the hardest decisions I had to make as deputy mayor was we didn't provide permanent kind of re retention of affordability at Stuyvesant Town because it was going to cost us, we thought, like $900 million where we could build like 5,000 units across the river um, at at Hunter's Point South. What's the right choice? They're hard choices. They're on some level moral choices, but our view was we need to dramatically increase the supply of housing. Now we also believed that it was important to have mixed income communities, but there's a limit to that because the cost in certain places is gonna be a lot higher than it is in others. Those are choices leaders actually have to make. We're going to have to leave it there because we are out of time, and that is a great place to leave it because that's the fundamental question of, of housing in New York City is the supply versus demand, and, and how do you sell that? Well, thank you very much to Alicia Glenn and Dan Doctoroff, uh, who were both deputy mayor for economic development in New York City. And a reminder to our viewers, if you've enjoyed this broadcast and our other ones, please go to therealdeal.com and subscribe. And you can tune in back in Friday at five o'clock and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at that time to see TRD Talks Live. Thank you again, everyone. See you next time.